Today we're talking Barca, FC Barcelona, and we're discussing an illuminating new book on a club that's described as more than a club. I'm joined by Simon Cooper, author of, Bar of Barca, FC journalist, and he's written the newly published story of how this extraordinary club uh, grew. This is the latest of our reaction uh, videos uh, discussing uh, books with leading authors, hosted by me, Ian Martin, editor of Reaction. Subscribe to Reaction uh, just by hitting the subscribe button on the on the YouTube video. And if you want to become a member of Reaction and read my weekly newsletter on politics and economics and culture and all sorts of other things that the site does, then you can sign up. The details are below. And we're also, uh, for a time limited period, making Simon's book book of the uh, book of the month, and we'll send you a a free copy as a as a welcome gift from us. Now, Simon, welcome. Thank you. First, what does it mean, that phrase, when we hear it said that Barcelona is more than a club? Uh, Misca and Klub, it dates probably to the 60s, and in the early 70s, a Barcelona president made it his campaign slogan. And this was in the end of the Franco era in Spain, dictatorship of General Franco, and it was understood at the time that nobody could say it, that Mesco and Club referred to the idea that Barcelona is the unarmed army of Catalonia. Barcelona is the representative of this region that doesn't have a state, that in a way, when you see the Barcelona football team play, they are Catalonia. So Mesco and Club really meant we're more than a football club, we represent our region. And then in the last 20 years, it grew into something else. It grew into meaning we play beautiful football. For a while, it meant we don't have a shirt sponsor. We have UNICEF on our shirts mm. and stand for certain valores, values. So Barcelona is not in any way a business. It's very unlike, let's say, an English football club that can be bought and sold. It belongs to its members. So all these things are part of what it means to be more than a club. So tell us a bit more there about this house of... Barca, this peculiar ownership structure where you, you mentioned there, it's almost as, uh, like a class system within Catalan society. It's really something to be involved in, in the ownership and it's passed on through the generations. Yeah, I mean, in England, we have the tradition that our professional football clubs have been limited companies for well over a century. So you can buy and sell them. So someone like Roman Abramovich can come in and buy Chelsea. And some Spanish football clubs are member associations. And so if you think that Barcelona is like a, an English equivalent would be the village cricket club, just grown to immense proportions, where you have 150,000 members, these are mostly local people, often when somebody dies, their membership is passed on to their children or grandchildren, and it's a real club, it's an association, it's the way sports clubs originally were in the 18th century. And the idea of selling it is sort of sacrilegious. And I've seen people at Barcelona be very kind of snooty about English football clubs that any kind mm. of tyke or oligarch can walk in and buy the place. Owning Barcelona, being a, you don't really own it, being a member of Barcelona is also a sign that you're part of the Catalan middle class, often that you're quite bourgeois, um, that you speak Catalan at home. It's really a sign of belonging. It's a certain kind of identity. But it means though, doesn't it, that it has this just has this this fascination for its for its for its members and for the fans and its intensity of focus on what's going on in the club and in the players and we'll we'll come to we'll come to Messi uh, a little later on and, and and what unfolded there and the peculiar role that um, that that story played in the you know maybe the denouement of the Barcelona story but it, there does seem to be and Gary Lineker talks about it in the book doesn't he this, when you get off the plane as a newly signed player, there's so, so much is perceived to be at stake by the fans and by the owners. Yeah, I mean, what struck me in Barcelona is that the way that British people talk about the prime minister or the government or Brexit and Americans talk about the presidency or about Trump. In Barcelona, that conversation is focused on the football club or the club president. So in Britain, people will say, did you see what the prime minister just said? Isn't it an outrage? And in Barcelona, they'll say that about the club president. And people will take sides in their elections and the main elections in Catalonia, which attract the most attention, are about the Barcelona presidency, the club presidency. It's, it's sort of the highest role you can occupy in Catalonia. And so there's immense tension around uh, what the club does. And on the nightly news, often the, 
the leading news item will be to do with Barcelona, even with Catalan independence, which divided Catalans or people who live in Catalonia, many of them are not Catalans, but it divided the region in the way that Brexit divided the UK or that Trump divided the US, mm. that uh, the club will be expected to comment. So FC Barcelona says, we believe that the imprisoned Catalan politicians should be released. We believe there should be a referendum on Catalan independence. So yeah, FC Barcelona is at the center of conversation in a way that's not the case in the UK. I mean, Manchester United is hugely discussed in the UK every day, but really very much as a football club, they're not expected to have a point of view on the goings on in the nation. Yeah, I suppose that was w what was so interesting, wasn't it, about the Rashford situation on, uh, you know, on school on school meals. That that it it was straying almost into that into that um, into that territory. Yeah, well, the national football team you sort of expect that, especially during a big tournament. So during the Nash during a, the Euro, the England football team are England. They kind of represent the nation. Those eleven yeah. young men, they are England, and so all the debates that the country was having about let's say woke, for example, or that racism were reflected through the national team. But during a club season in England, we don't really have that so much. And we don't feel that when Manchester City play Chelsea, that something more than football is at stake. Yeah. So tell us about the, the genesis of Barca, your, your new book, the inside story of the world's greatest football club, because you've had a lot of access down the years, but this is not something you just turned up saying, I know that's an interesting story, story. And I think this is a, a convenient point to tell it it goes back decades with you you've you, you've traveled there written stories about it what is it that, that has fascinated you and prompted you to write the book well i mean i grew up in the netherlands i'm not dutch but i grew up there and i fell in love with football there began playing on the streets and at a club there and so like everyone who grew up a dutch football fan of my generation johan Cruyff was a great hero he was a player he was the man who invented modern football he was a coach and Krauf played for Barcelona in the 70s and he went there as a coach in 1988 and he really gave the club its identity and its way of playing. And so people in Holland see Barcelona as a Dutch football club. So I grew up very much, you know, liking it and obsessed with it. And then in 1992, I walked in for the first time as a very young journalist, author. And ever since I've been visiting and writing about it. And when I was there in 2019, writing a Financial Times article, I realized they were really opening not all their doors, but most of their doors for me. So any interview I asked for with the club presidents, with the players, with the head coach, that they would give. And I know that in modern football, that's one reason I don't really write about football on a day-to-day -day basis. You get no access. You're stuck in the press conference listening to the manager, you know, blame the referee for the defeats. And then you're given a 12-minute sit-down with a player where you have to plug a sponsor. It's all just, you're kept at bay. There's no access. And at Barcelona, I was sitting at this lunch with various people, including the pres club president, drinking wine for hours. And I thought, this is really unusual. And so I wrote the article for the FT and I thought, there's more here, there's a book here about how this institution works, how this thing works from the inside, how it works as a workplace and how they created this beautiful football. So I asked my contacts at the club, I said, look, you gave me this for an article. If I did a book, would you cooperate? Would you open doors for me? And they said, yeah, sure. And to Barcelona's eternal credit, you know, even as the club was kind of collapsing, they kept letting me come back. They set up dozens of interviews with a lot of people on the inside of the club, the people you don't see, the psychologists, the youth coaches, the mm. nutritionists, the doctors, the business people. So I just kept going back and interviewing these people and the club never asked me, you know, can we see your manuscript in advance? We'd like to censor that interview. None of that. I sent them the book at the same time we sent it out to journalists about two weeks ago. There was no attempt to intervene. And actually this guy in the Barcelona press office sent me this lovely email a few days ago saying, I got your book. I'm so happy you did it. Congratulations. So I wrote back and I, I said, uh, you're a gentleman, you know, this is not what you get. This is not football. This is not how football typically works. But but it is, as you describe in the book, it is this, it's, it's more than just a football club. It is this phenomenal global institution. Um, this organization has so much clout and so many followers on, on social media and so many fans, sort of tourist, tourist fans. What you describe there is not, that's not the way in which a large financial institution or a major company or any other institution I can think of would behave 
is it, do you think that's just a, it, that's just a function of of its unusual history or or your personal connections with the place? I'm going to be very immodest just for a sec. They they have this annual sports writing prize, and in 2007, God knows why, God knows how they awarded it, but I I won it in 2007. So they brought me over and they fessed me and they let me play on the Cup Nou. They had the a TV crew from the website, from the Barcelona website, filming, you know, scoring goals, loading <laughs> second quarters. It was amazing. And so when I went back in 2019, this Italian woman, uh, her name is Odisio, won the prize. And she was awarded it the day I was there. And they said, you have to come to the lunch for her. Um, you know, uh, all the ex-winners here at the round are going to be at the prize ceremony. You have to be there. And so that was where I was drinking wine with the presidents and everyone. Yeah. And so I think what happened is that I became, in their minds, a club member. I became an alum. And so they trusted me. They saw me as somebody in the inside. They didn't think I would write only nice and kind things about them. But they thought, you know, he's sort of family. He's not, um, he's not defanged. He's not um, safe. He's still writing. But kind of he's one of us. And I think that is partly why this thing happened. Interesting. Let's go back to Cruyff. You mentioned him earlier on, your, your, your hero. You describe uh, Johan Cruyff um, as the architect. Tell us a bit about where he, where he came from. And it, it, there is a, there's a beautiful description in the book of, the, of, the, um, of, of his roots. And just explains, explain for us where Cruyff uh, sprung from. Yeah, I mean, it, it's strange with Messi becoming the focus of news the last week because people are saying, you know, Simon's written a book about Barcelona and Messi, but to my mind, I've written a book about Barcelona, Krauf and Messi. And Krauf is the most interesting man in modern football. And he's this guy, his father is a grocer. They live opposite the Ajax Stadium. And from the age of four, Krauf is walking to the Ajax Stadium and kicking a ball. And, um, you know, he's in the changing room with the first team players. He grows up essentially inside the club and he hears all these tactical talks. And I actually just some semi-professional team in the Netherlands. They're nothing special when he's growing up in the 50s and 60s. And Krauf, he's a genius. He, you know, comparing to Gaudi in the book, which might sound pretentious, but Krauf understands that football is a game about space and geometry and it's about the past. And so he's this 17, 18 year old, he's in the Ajax first team, he's a semi-pro, he's earning in modern money, probably a few hundred quid a, a, a month. And then Rinus Michels, who's also a genius, becomes the manager of Ajax, it's a semi-professional team, and they find each other. Mm. And Michels has this crazy idea in the mid-60s, this semi-professional team of Amsterdam East is going to win European Cups. It's insane. And Michels and Krauf, they talk football, they're part of, there's this generation in Amsterdam, of brilliant footballers, and they create the style that Bayern Munich now play, that Liverpool now play, that Manchester City now play, which is you play in the other team's half. Football is about fast passing combinations. As soon as you lose the ball, you press. When you see Manchester City, Guardiola is the son of Krauf, the spiritual son of Krauf. He was brought into the first team by Krauf as a teenager in Barcelona. That is the football that was invented in Amsterdam East in the 1960s by Krauf and Michels. And people know it as total football, which the Dutch never called it. It was the game that Holland played in the World Cup in 1974 that set the world alight. Holland didn't win the final, but it was brilliant. And so Krauf brings that game to Barcelona, first as a player in 73, and then as a, much more so as a coach from 1988. And he walks in in 88 and says, this is how we're going to play. We have the ball. We're in the other team's half. When we lose it, we win it back within seconds. We never leave their half. And it works. And they win their first Champions League in 1992 at Wembley against Sampdoria. And so the football you see today is the updated version, the best football today. What Italy played at the Euro, the way Italy won the Euro, you know, pressing, overlapping fullbacks, um, constant attack, constant interpassing, making passing triangles. That's the football that Krauf invented. Yeah, but I mean, very different from the, the, the you know, the English, I don't know, sort of yeah. psychological over-emotionalism, you know, over-emotional investment before, I think, in which... I think the way that Krauf, on the, Krauf said, football is a game you play in your head. You play with your head, you think. And it's really geometry, it's about space. Yeah. And I think in England, partly because of the, 
I don't want to overgeneralize and speak in abstractions about Britain, but I, I've tried to think about this for 30 years. And this is my take. I might be on the wrong track, but this is what I think. I think that because the it, it's a warrior tradition that English football was shaped into from the Victorians through the two world wars. And it was made by managers and players who, if they hadn't been in wars themselves, had been shaped by the warrior uh, veneration that the British had really for a very long time after World War II. So the, the qualities that the British liked in footballers was battle, was fight, was tackling hard, was winning headers. Uh, players like Brian Robson, somebody like Terry Butcher, you know, playing on with a bleeding yeah. head in 1989, as you and I know, that's a kind of archetypal image of British football. People love that. And so the British conceived of football as a kind of a version of warfare. It's about fight and battle. And the Dutch, who don't really have a warrior tradition, not in modern times. They didn't think of it at all like that. So it's a completely different way. And then in Brazil, of course, they thought of it differently. I think they yeah. thought of it more as a kind of art form. So each of these places had their way of thinking about football. And in the end, it turned out that Krauf was right and the British were wrong. The, the warrior way of it doesn't work. But there's a curious thing that happens in, in that period, where, as you, as you described, Krauf is remaking football. There's also a period where English football, before the horrors of the, of, of the mid-80s, has a, a golden period as well and a European story. So what is it, you talked about football as geometry there, what is it that, say, that Liverpool were doing in the late 70s or early 80s uh, or Nottingham Forest? Were they drawing on Cruyff or were they doing something completely different? They weren't drawing on Cruyff, but they were drawing on, I think what Brian Clough at Nottingham Forest as well did and what Liverpool did in the 70s and 80s, drawing on also the Scottish tradition, which is a bit different, is a bit more, was then in those days, a bit more about passing. If you think of players like Doug Leash and Hansen. Faster, yeah. It, it was it was more about, so Clough would buy players at Forest who could pass. And the so the, the best British teams had that, but they also had this, we'll get stuck in, we'll win the headers, we'll win the tackles. And that combination was pretty deadly in the 70s and 80s, when other teams, other countries were physically sort of backward and weak. And then from the 80s, so Germany is also strong in the, until the 90s with this kind of physical style. The Germans are going to run fast to you, than you. They're going to win the tackles. Yeah. They're going to keep going to the 93rd minute. And that also worked. It obviously worked better than the British. It worked very well. And then what you get from the 90s is football professionalizes. Everybody's fit. Everybody can run, you know, 100 meters in 11 seconds. Um, everybody is um, giving their all in the tackle. Everyone can head a bit. And so the English and the German virtues lose ground and it becomes much more about, but can you pass? Can you make triangles? I, I'm speaking in a very sketchy way about decades of history, and I'm not saying that all this is exact and that you could map it out on the graph, but it's something like this. And you describe, you describe in Barca how you had, I think rather distressingly, not, not your fault at all, you have a falling out with, with your hero. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I finally got to interview Krauf in 2000, which was, you know, a very exciting moment. I'm in his villa, that's at the edge of town, it's, it's lovely, it's, you know, you meet your hero. And I, I, he'd done a very complicated deal, his foundation with The Observer, which I was writing for at the time, and we were allowed to publish it. And then all deals with Krauf were complicated, because he was surrounded by these small-time mafiosi, and he fancied himself as a businessman, but he didn't really understand about when you agree a contract, you actually have to go through with it or everything. He kept negotiating even after the contract was signed. And so uh, he fell out with the Observer. And then months later, I wrote this piece in a small Dutch literary football journal saying, you know, I met my hero, this is what it was like. And I got paid something like 400 pounds for it. So yeah, I got paid, but it was not, it wasn't like uh, I was smoking cigars on the Riviera or it. it was more, I was writing about my hero for a small magazine. And he was really uh, irate and he got his um, henchmen in the Dutch media to publish articles saying I was a crook and a fraud. And it was very upsetting. So, yeah, my only encounter with him was very friendly the night of, but then we fell out. Yeah, never, never meet your heroes. Another, never meet your heroes, no. The, another thing which comes across very strongly is the, the role of the youth academy, the, the, the Masia. It figures large in, the, large in the story. And it's highly unusual what Barcelona does. And it's a big part of 
what explains the, su the success? How did they do it? I mean, there's a couple of things. One is that, so they create this, they turn this old farmhouse into dormitories where the boys sleep from around the region. They recruit kids from villages like Guardiola, for someone like Iniesta, who came from a few hundred kilometers away, and you sleep in the dormitories, you grow up in the Masia. And from 88, when Krauf becomes head coach, Krauf was fascinated by youth development. I mean, that's the thing sort of he cared about most. And he said, the only thing I care about is can you pass? So whether you're one meters 50 tall or two meters tall, I don't care. We'll just take you if you can pass. And so you get these very little boys who often are the best passers because they have to pass because if you're little like Xavi or Messi or Iniesta, you have to get out of the way of the big kid and you do that by releasing the ball quickly. So often the smallest players, as Craig knew from his own experience as a small kid, are the ones who pass best. And so they had this whole generation that comes out of the Masia in the late 90s, early 2000s, which is the best generation of youth players in the history of football. And they can all pass, and that's the generation of Barcelona players. We know Messi, Xavi, Iniesta, Puyol, Piqué, Busquets, etc. And the, they win the World Cup, Spaniards without Messi, and with Messi, they win the Champions League, they play the best football ever. And the other thing that Masia did, which I think was not so much crowd, was more Catalonia and Barcelona, is they treated kids well. It was sort of like a big Catholic family where they were taking in kids who were Barcelona fans or the sons of Barcelona members. And remember, FC Barcelona is a middle-class club, so it was infused by these kind of middle-class values of we are going to make sure you get a school education. So kids like Guardiola and Iniesta, they actually go to university while they're at the Masia. And we're not going to shout at the kids because that's mean. And 90% of them are never going to play professional football anyway. We're going to be nice to them. And so it was a kind of loving environment. And that turned out to be a competitive environment advantage because around 2000, I visited this English Premier League Academy of one particular club. And I saw the coaches treated the boys just horrendously. They would scream at them. It was like a parody of army culture in the 1950s. The coaches behaving like these sergeant major types would scream at these 16 year old boys, you're, you're rubbish, uh, you're never going to make it, et cetera, et cetera. And the boys really suffered. And of course, 90% of them, they never made it as yeah. pros anyway. So it was a complete waste of their youth. And Barcelona didn't do that. And it's very important because if you're nice to boys, you're not going to lose boys through brutality. English academies and elsewhere as well were losing boys through brutality all the time because most youth academies were so horrible that a lot of boys just wanted to drop out. Yeah. Another big figure is uh, Guardiola, you've mentioned. He's the ultimate realisation of the of, of Cruyff's vision, really, isn't he? You, you say he was, he was his footballing son, very nice phrase, raised inside the cathedral that he built. Yeah, so Guardiola, you know, he comes to the Masia, he's the son of a bricklayer from a village outside Barcelona. And he comes to the Masia age about 14. He's a bright boy, but he's very slow and he's weak and he's thin and he can't tackle. And Krauf come, goes to watch him. Krauf's the first team coach at the time and he says, uh, take this boy off, we're putting him in the first team. And the coaches say, you're crazy, he's weak, he's thin, he can't tackle. And Krauf says, yes, but he can pass. So Guardiola comes into the first team and he meets Krauf and he thought, and he thinks, and he says, before I met Krauf, I didn't understand anything about football. Nobody told me anything about football before. And when I met Krauf, it was like meeting Merlin the magician. Suddenly everything made sense. He's like the best school teacher you ever had. And so Guardiola has this intuitive understanding and agreement of Krauffian football. But Guardiola is more educated than Krauff. Guardiola can speak in coherent sentences. He can explain things to people which Krauff can't do. Krauff has this kind of, Krauff left school at 12. He's an auto didact, very limited vocabulary. What he says makes little sense to other people. Mm. And so Guardiola creates rules. So Krauf would go out and take training without a single exercise written down. he just do it off the top of his head. And Guardiola says, no, we're going to plan this thing out. And so, for example, Guardiola creates rules like the five second rule. When we lose the ball, we're going to press for five seconds. Uh, when we win the ball, we complete 15 passes before we launch the attack because then everyone is in the right place. And Guardiola could, would scout the other team. He would spend two days sometimes watching the, other, the, the opponents on video and then he'd say, okay, boys, this is their weakness. This is how we're going to beat them. You do this, you do that. And so he did all this kind of rigorous preparation that Krauf never did. So Guardiola was Krauf, not original like Krauf was, 
but more rigorous, better, and newer. So what about Messi? I mean, it's just as the book is, you know, uh, is, is, is ready for publication, the whole thing unfolds, the whole drama with him, with him leaving the club. But firstly, just before we get to that, Tell us where does he where does he come from? Because I mean, you describe him in, as as another Don Bradman. There's no one like him, and the story is is bizarre, isn't it? You know, the way he's uprooted, the story of his signing, his immersion in the club, the way he almost becomes becomes the club. How do you explain it? Is it just is it raw talent or hard work or and you you, you talk about trying to understand what makes a great footballer on and off the on and off the pitch but he re he really is an enigma i think there's two extraordinary things about messi one i mean he's a great latin american individualist and we've seen them over time for you know maradona neymar the great latin american who comes to europe who can dribble garincha who can beat a team on his own and messi's that he's the best dribbler of his time but what happens then at 13, he comes to Barcelona, he signs a contract on napkin, Barcelona pay, pays for his growth hormones, they move the whole family over, they put a big bet on this kid who has dwarfism, you know, he's only going to become without hormones, going to be less than one meter 60 tall. So they make a bet on this kid. And what Barcelona do in the Masia for years, is that they say to this kid, yes, you're the best dribbler, you're the best individualist, you don't need to pass, you can dribble past the team, but you know what, you're going to pass. Because when you get to the first team, when you play with people like Samuel Eto and Ronaldinho, they're going to tell you to pass. And Messi refuses, doesn't pass. He, he, he tries to just do it himself. And at 17, he gets into the first team. But he has had this education in the Messiah for years. And at 17, he gets into the first team and he tries to dribble past the entire professional teams, past Chelsea and Real Madrid, and they kick him and they, you know, they, uh, they triple team him and they're tactically strong and they're bigger. And Messi finally, and the, the players in the team are saying, you're going to pass the ball to me. You're not doing this by yourself. You're giving it to me. And Messi does. He learns to pass in the first team. It takes him a year or two in the first team, but he, he's had this education. And so over time, he, the best individual player of his generation also becomes the best collective player of his generation. Because he's come to this Crowfian club with a collective football system, and he's a clever boy in football, he learns that. He's both the best dribbler of his time and the best passer of his time. And that's what makes him special in, in a way that always makes him better than Maradona, better than Garincha. Uh, he has both. He's a European and a Latin American football, the best of both. Yeah. Then, of course, Messi's departure is, is bound up with what you describe in the book as the crumbling of the cathedral. And, of course, there are court cases, setbacks, salaries get out of hand, and there's this background or political upheaval in, um, in, in, in Catalonia. In, the, in Messi's case, is, is it just that he is, he's too good, the club comes to depend on him too much, pays him too much money, and that ends up destabilizing things? I mean, firstly, when you're number one, you stop thinking. So other clubs copied the way Barcelona play, the high-pressing attacking style, copied the Masia. English and German clubs and the FAs were there all the time checking it out. And so you see that England, historically a backward football culture, now produces Barcelona-style players, which it never did before, like Foden, like Sancho, like Saka, little guys who can play football. And that's because English clubs really copied the Masia. And then, you know, when you have money coming in, just money coming out of your ears, like Barcelona had a few years, you get lazy with it, you overspend. So they bought the wrong players. They spent more than half a billion euros combined on Coutinho, Dembele and Griezmann, none of whom really performed in the Camp Nou. You, Messi's father keeps coming to the club for salary raises. And every time you say yes, because of course he's the most important player, so you do. And then in the end, you find yourself with a debt of over a billion pounds and, uh, you know, the Spanish league saying you can't spend anymore. So they got lazy, they wasted their money. But I think also, you know, I mean, there's this, I think there's this sort of British belief that players should be kept down. They should not run the club. And I understand that. But I think also when you have a great player, you sort of want to give him responsibility. You want to make him the main man and say, look, Leo, we will do what you want in terms of buying players you want, hiring coaches you want. But you're in charge then. You've really got to perform and you're responsible for the result. 
And that's sort of what Barcelona did. And we can criticize it now. And of course it's gone wrong at the end, but look, for 15 years, this was the most productive player coach, player club relationship in the history of football. They want everything. We're talking about the second city of a mid-sized, not very rich European country that was the best club in the world for some years. And they won everything. And it was mostly messy, or well, not mostly messy, but he was the biggest single component of that. And so it's an amazing success. And it, okay, it's gone wrong at the end, but we mustn't forget the amazing success of the man in management project that Barcelona embarked on in around 2003 4. I mean, I, th- I was very, I was just struck by the parallel with the Beatles, really. I was just at, at various yeah. points that, you know, the um, Michel's um, Cruyff partnership and then also the messy thing it's that that part in the creative process where the talent is allowed to take over and it might end it might end in acrimony but in the uh, in, in the in- intervening years you get revolver and sergeant pepper yeah. and um this is the long and winding road problem. this is the long and winding road moment <laughs> so what about um him afterwards then how will he how will he cope being uprooted from from barcelona and landing in a new club will he perform I mean, it's the story of so many expat families, you know, in the kind of sexist family structure, the husband goes to his workplace, people speak his language anyway, because it's a Paris Saint-Germain, really a Latin American club, and he'll be fine. If you've got Messi on a football field, he's happy, he's fine. He didn't really want to leave, partly because when he told his sons and his wife last year that he wanted to leave and they were going to go and move to a different country, they all burst into tears. And that was a shock for him and his sons don't want to move to a new country and new school, make new friends. And that, you know, that's, I think, possibly the main reason why he decided this summer that he wants to stay with Barcelona, this fading club. And so I think the family might struggle, but the player will be fine. Messi is Messi. He belongs on a football field and that's the place where he feels happy and at ease. It's off the field that his life, he's less in control of his life. That's true of all the great footballers. There's... A very nice line at the end where you conclude uh, movingly maybe this story is now ending but you were you were glad to be there to cover it is it is it over for Barca or or can can they reinvent themselves as a club look they might reinvent themselves I mean a lot of people at Barca even two years ago were saying to me I think we're going to become Manchester United which is we'll still be a giant club but we might not win very much and so we'll have to cope with being we have to make money and survive as a big club known around the world that doesn't win prizes like United after Ferguson. And somehow they will manage. They'll have worse players. They'll have less money. But in 100 years' time, Barcelona will be here. will outlive us. I think one thing the book did for me, because like you, I write about politics and society and culture most of the time. Like you, I do football on the side. Like you, I got very emotionally invested in Brexit. You were on one side, I was on the other. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I found that the last five years in politics and culture and climate change and COVID were really horrible and ugly. And we saw the worst of the world and the worst of humanity and it wasn't pretty and there was a lot of hatred around. And when I was younger, I thought, I don't want to write about football all the time because this is not really important. And I'm glad I got out of it because I didn't want to be at Everton Aston Villa on a Tuesday night writing about Q1 and why. I'm glad I'm not doing that all the time. I, I want to write about more important things. But I've come to feel, especially after the last five years, actually football is often something more beautiful and better than the stuff that we write about all the time. Uh, so I think that all these subjects like Brexit and COVID and climate and Trump are depressing, uh, drag you down. And when I see Barcelona, the Barcelona of the Messi years, I watched the Wembley final the other day, the Wembley final 10 years ago, Barcelona demolishing Man United. I thought, you know, this is one of the most beautiful things that humans have done. Not to sound too pretentious about it, but Barcelona and Messi did beautiful things. And I, it made me happy. It enriched my life. Uh, Krauf enriched my life. Messi enriched my life. And I don't think it's now, now I've come to see it. It's not somehow something lower writing about that stuff. Beautifully put, uh, Simon Cooper. And it's an, it's an outstanding book. Barca and it is our book of the month so if you subscribe to reaction for time limited period we'll send you a copy as a welcome uh, gift thank you for joining us uh, Simon if you're not a subscriber to reaction on YouTube just hit the subscribe button until next time thank you for joining us